buy it. Yes. All right. Um, good afternoon. Um, so just before I start, who was here at the climate change meeting last year? I think there was everyone except and were you there, Bob? Sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I think most people have already heard most of this information. I think I wasn't in I sat over there. there though. Yeah. So yeah, I just I'm, so probably a few councillors that aren't here. This is probably okay. But um, that's all right. So I want to just speed run through it, not get too into the details because we've all heard it before. Um, and it's mostly just a few slides at towards the end where I kind of just wanted some feedback and a bit of a vibe check really around how do we go about this review um, for the next year for me. Um, and so, yeah, just kind of um, what level of the scope and scale do you want to see climate change work in the district? So, um, so yeah, I'll just quickly recap the national regional information, Southwide information, what the strategy um, says currently, and then, yeah, this is the main bit here where I wanted your feedback um, and the review considerations. Um, and this is always my fun fact that climate change is being to a harder more mm. male, I think. Yes. Which mm. is, yeah. Um, oh, so male are being born. It's this you know, little, little temperature changes can end up having massive impacts that we don't always think about. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so national context. So when I read this oh, last God. year, it is, the election had just happened about a month or so it's... prior. We're a bit like, what the heck's going to happen? Um, so in terms of New Zealand's overall emissions profile, unsurprisingly, almost half of it is comes from agriculture, and a lot of another big proportion of it comes from energy and a large part transport. And the energy side is the thing we can do a lot more about as kind of individuals and possibly council as well. Um, oh. Oh. There you go, Amy. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I always joke, I'm like the worst millennial at school with technology. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this was kind of a big thing with the election. We weren't sure what this was going to happen, what was going to happen with this, with the coalition government. Luckily, they've decided to maintain our commitments towards climate change. So limiting global temperature increase to 1.5 degrees, uh, reducing all of our greenhouse gas emissions to zero by 2050 and then reducing our methane as well. Um, you know, the policies don't necessarily line up to these targets, but, um, you know, at least... And they're also reviewing the methane. At least they're not hurting it. Yeah, well, the, the Climate Change Commission is actually currently consulting on the targets as they are currently. So hopefully they don't change. Maybe they might get stronger. Who knows? <laughs> Um, I think we know. And this is another report that came out last year by Deloitte. It was all just um, economic modelling and things. But if we took, as a nation, decisive action against climate change, we can lead to $74 billion in increased revenue in our economy versus a negative um, GDP if we continue to ignore climate change and the damage it will have on our um, communities, businesses, infrastructure, and whatnot. Um, yeah, so actual cost, we know that, but an action will likely cost far more. Um, and yeah, this was just to say that there's a point where, yes, you have to invest a certain amount of money, but after a while, then you will see the benefits paying off, which I'm sure going through the long term planning process, all of you know this thing in various different contexts. Um, cool. And then so regionally, um, our emissions profile is a bit different than the national. Um, so because uh, obviously regionally it includes um, everything over the hill, transport is um, just as big as our agricultural emissions um, and only a small amount, 5% coming from waste. Um, but we commit a lot of uh, time and energy into waste, which we need to, but um, yeah. In terms of what can we do that will make the most amount of difference in yeah. climate change, um, how can we yeah, move things along more quickly or more um, do things that have a bigger impact? Um, 
And then this also talks about our forestry. So um, with the total emissions minus what we have from forestry emissions, um, then we can like reduce 2 million tons of CO2 equivalent of that total that we've got there. Um, so yeah, we come to a uh, total of five-ish. Can I ask a question? Because so, the one thing that I, I I guess I find a little bit difficult to wrap my head around is I understand that, you know, in the South Wairarapa, um, with regards to our livestock, but it was seen it was seen when COVID hit and cars stopped going that actually it didn't matter where we were in New Zealand, the, the effect of the, I mean, the livestock didn't go down. And yet, and yet, it Everything was it was there. well shown that actually the emissions were were so much lower just from not having vehicles. So I kind of, you know, I, I can't have like like I do feel like a lot of our cows get a bit of bit of sick, you know, like for our for our agri so easy on the air area area because it's I don't you know it's, no. it's it's hard for me to understand exactly where these figures and why they're almost as high as vehicles when it was proven yep. that how much the emissions went road. down over COVID when no one produced their vehicles. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I guess so this is carbon dioxide. So this is talking about like carbon dioxide sequestration and 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 versus so one of the main issues with livestock stuff is it's methane. So it's a different yeah. greenhouse gas. So over COVID, our carbon emissions went down, our methane emissions didn't go down. And the difference when you're looking at carbon versus methane, methane doesn't last in the atmosphere as long, like it's five to eight years, I think, but it's about 80% worse than carbon for trapping heat. So, so climate change, right? Because it sticks up in the atmosphere for a yeah. whole lot longer and traps heat. Um, so that's a very important yeah. one because we, we still are feeling the impacts of stuff that was going on 30 years ago. We're now having, having the impacts of that. But with agriculture, it's methane, so it's a lot faster acting and a lot worse. But if we're able to, that's one where we can get really good gains on. So it's difficult, especially when you're just trying to boil it down to tables and graphs, but it's a lot of different facts. Trying to understand it. Trying to look at. So yeah, okay. you're absolutely right. Because it because so it just sitting there, thing. you know, like like I mean, we get carbon credits and this and that. Mm. What are we getting for methane? You know, like I, I guess where's the where's the opposite? Yeah. So when you grow a tree, a tree soaks up carbon and it locks it. In yeah. The yeah, yeah, yeah. But what I'm saying is, what what nothing thing? you can do. Methane. Nothing. So there's nothing you can do for methane. Nothing you can do for methane. Once it's out there, it's out there. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. It's yes. Stop making it, mm -hmm. and that's it. And the nice thing about methane is that, you know, within a generation, it can be gone, right? Like five to ten years, we can we can shift the needle a lot with methane reduction in terms of the impact it will have on global warming with yeah. climate change. Going back to what you about COVID, and in terms of, yes, cows, obviously, you know, get a pretty bad rep all the time, oh. um, and but there's not a lot of alternatives we can do, but there are alternative traits for. And so and it's also, yeah, like what are those easy wins and what are, you know, some alternatives that we can put in place now. Whereas, you know, the only option for cows right now uh don't have. Or, you know, there's very like there's some technologies that are very, you know, vaccine. Put their poo somewhere else uh, and not in the water. Yeah. So there's some very emerging technologies, but not in the way that we have for transport. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. But yeah, I think I've come there must be a way to kind of catch it. Yeah, methane and make it this. I was just thinking. I was like, thank God for being here. Yeah. Okay. So this is everybody. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. So between the 2018-19 financial year and the 21-22 financial year, we yeah, we saw an 18 percent decrease in transportation, likely due to the fact that we couldn't drive mm. anywhere for a certain amount of time. Um, and so I, I believe all the evidence sort of shows that we're rebounding back up to where we were before. But whereas the waste one, where we've seen a 15% decrease, that's probably more of a true representation because the landfills have put in gas capture technology. So um, while that's rebounding, that sort of reduction is likely to remain that sort of way. Do they have that in the South Wadapa and in, and in Carterton? Um, yep, so all the waste here goes over to Bonnie Glen. And, and Bonnie Glen has it via the truck. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, 
Cool. And so under the Wellington Regional Leadership Committee, there are a range of climate change projects. So we've got the Climate Change Impacts Assessment, which I believe is due to go to the committee in March. What do we need? April. Maybe sometimes. <laughs> um, the Emissions Reduction Strategy, which has already been adopted, and the Food Systems Strategy as well, which is entering into phase two. Um, so yeah, there's regional collaborative work going on. Um, and then these are just some of our basic projections for our region. So this is the RCP 2.6, so we know do everything we can to limit global warming, and this is a keep plundering on as we always have. Um, so yeah, and, you know, in our worst case scenario, um, temperature could get up to three degrees higher than it is currently mm -hmm. on the South Wallapa. Um, and then this one here, that dark red, is 40 to 50 days of greater than 25 degrees, which um, someone feels <laughs> like, that sounds amazing. But yeah, it's not when you're already seeing drought yet again mm -hmm. in our region. Yeah. Um, and for all of our industry Summer. that we have here. So yeah, it will get hotter. I think you make a good point there. Um, we, we, the Wadarapa, are officially in a drought and it's yes. not been something that's been widely talked about, but we are currently in a drought to the point where, you know, the powers that be, various different council committees and subcommittees are seeking uh, extra support for our local, particularly our farming communities, um, in the face of, of that yep. very real drought that they're experiencing. Yep. Oh, already yeah. outside of things getting worse. Yeah, I think I, I read a, um, a Greater Wellington like they do like uh, seasonal reports and yeah, yet again this is like the warmest summer mm. we've ever experienced then. Yeah. Compared to the last two where it's been so wet. So yeah, going from so. that having too much water for a couple of years to back to our droughts sort of conditions oh. that we're cold. used to. Um, and then yeah equally um it's gonna get dry. So not only really hot, dry, less rainfall overall. Um, so um, down this area, expecting negative four, is that, oh, a four percent decrease in rainfall um, towards the coast. Um, and then this dark thing here, so it's looking like eight to ten days, where we have ten days proceeding with no rain. Um, so two weeks without rainfall. Um, if we let it get to the worst possible case. Um, and yeah, so just some South Wallapa specific information. Um, so yeah, obviously we are an agricultural district. Most of our emissions all come from agriculture. And then obviously the next uh, biggest proportion is from uh, transport. Um, and then this one kind of breaks it down a wee bit more. Um, so in terms of your agriculture, 76% of it's coming from your enteric fermentation, which is yeah, your, your main thing, sort of processes from cows, um, some of it from manure, and then some of it from leaching. And okay. the way that this particular study was done, um, they also included the Wellington Airport and then split the emissions from the airport proportionally between the districts, so assuming that we occasionally catch a flight. Um, and so that's why there's things like jet kerosene. In our, in our inventory, despite us not having any airports. Um, and so, yeah, with That's our cool. forestry um, in the district, that brings our net emissions right down. Um, but yeah, we still want to be looking at how do we, it's still not at that net zero that we're kind of aiming for. Yeah, and again, these numbers, transportation between those two financial years, down 14%, waste down 13% because of that gas capture at point. Um, and yeah, I don't think there's many more graphs, but um, if you looked at it in the total, um, so gross emissions, obviously Wellington City is the biggest, followed by Marston and then us and South Line. Um, and then if you break it down for population, because we've got such a small population compared to our land area and our industries here, um, South Wallapa, per capita has the largest amount of emissions. And so, and then if you want to look at our, as a council organisation, um, so looking at what we can do in-house to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, wastewater treatment is the largest 
thing, um, followed by our electricity use. So I think some numbers here, it's the, the graph is a little bit misleading because the wastewater would you know, probably go all the way to that window. Um, like that. But yeah, so if, again, if we wanted to make a you know real difference to emissions, is there anything we can do in our waste for the treatment um, to bring those numbers down? So what what is there? What what is there? Is that like like with the UV lights or what 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 is there that we could put over it in a similar way of what Bonnie Glenn or I was gonna say what Bonnie do. So the castle. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think I know. Yeah, what can we what can we do? Other places, it depends what sort of waste water treatment plants you have. So I think in Christchurch and their like anaerobic digester digesters, you can capture that methane and then you can use it to power other things. So I think they use the methane to power their council buildings or something like that. So oh, is that Selwyn district? No. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that their wastewater treatment plants are a whole lot more sophisticated than our yeah, they've had to. Yeah, it had a big fire in it and then it was offline for ages and and now it's just really basic. Oh yeah, I mean it just stank badly for a very long time. Um and yeah, that they've had to redo parts of it and move some of it somewhere else. Yeah, it was yeah. a massive problem for them. But but more sophisticated they've ended up with something more sophisticated than our very, very unsophisticated system. Yeah, I mean they still no. use uh large ponds. Yeah. Um which they've incorporated into like um a bird sanctuary. So you yeah. kind of drive over and they're massive big ponds that, that do mostly use huge wetlands. Do we not? No, 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 because, fun fact, if you didn't go on the asset and amenities tour, a swan creates as much fecal matter as your average human. It's for real. Okay. And, and they was yeah, also eat all the grapes. What's his name? <laughs> it's half the, po it's it's half the pollution and water. Just love them floating all over our ponds. But they but just get to the load. Yeah. But I do wonder, you know, like, because it's methane and, and methane can be used for the... Um, you know, powering other other things. Uh, I, I don't know. I just kind of look at this as an opportunity rather than as a negative. Particularly for a council who knows that in its very near future we have to do upgrades to our waste. Yeah, and we've got a high yeah. population. Well, in our ponds, yeah. In our ponds. We need to increase, right? Catch it. <laughs> Uh, so it sounds as a council that you know, is embracing new technology wants to you know, right. take that next step rather than you know, band aid on what we're doing. Yeah. 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 So, Hit to um, that stuff. yeah, I'm not particularly well versed in all the different um, options. So, I'm looking to it more, but um, Street lights up. Because I'm not talking about the wastewater treatment plants. They're showing there, and they're like only 30.65. I'm actually talking about the wastewater, which is the ponds, yeah. right? Okay. So, um, and all the things about like, are you de-sludging? What are you doing with that sludge? Um, I don't believe we de-sludge. Right. We got to. Ah, uh, going to. Yes, it has to, to, to be done. Drying it up and sending it to landfill. Please will you, but... <laughs> Please will you. We need energy drying. And then all that oh, we food, really get captured in your meat bag in case that the rubbish dumps. Yes. Yeah. Geotech bags. Yeah. We've got big platforms that they sit on and fill up. That we've had to sludge. build. Fries out, and, mm. and then the rest of it can go to landfill. Anyway, carry on. <laughs> um, but yeah, obviously, Christchurch is a whole different scale and ball game than what Featherston might have. So yeah, what are some smaller scale things that we could implement? Yeah. Um, for our well, yes. Um, and Be the lady lady. show that um, we do have some forestry. Owned by council, and then that also helps decrease our corporate carbon emissions as well, um, whether or not we harvest them or not. What's the total black one? Um, it is your net emissions, so your um, total emissions minus your forestry. But I wonder if it takes into account that the forestry trucks ruin the roads, and then we have to rebuild the roads. Um, <laughs> probably not, and that's where, like, when you draw the line, it's so complicated, isn't it? So, it's, technically, the logging business should account for that, but yeah. probably not, yeah, um, at all. No, 
Oh, I kicked out of the south water. Any other questions, folks? Oh, sorry, I just kicked off. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's easier to jump on when you need to. Um, so, yeah, just a quick little recap on the strategy. Um, so, we have the strategy, and it's two volumes. The first volume is the strategy itself, adopted, I believe, in March for South Wallapa, the group at CBC. Yeah. Um, and so that goes over um, socio-economic context environment. It's a whole bunch of contextual information behind the districts. Um, and then our targets under that, and these are the same as what's in the Zero Carbon Act. So between 2020 and 2030, these councils aim to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, increase their reservoirs, which is, you know, trees, ways to soak up um, emissions, and then reduce our biogenic methane by 10% below 2017 levels, um, which is interesting because as a council, we don't actually know what our 2017 levels we are always going to hit that 10% then. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, and then it also said that we'll implement an action plan, not only for councils, but also for our community and our businesses as well. So that action plan came out a year later, um, brought in things like our greenhouse gas inventories, we've got other councils, um, you know, changing the way that we do things in-house, so fleet policies, um, transitioning to LED lighting instead of um, what we had before. Um, and then in the community, we just do a lot of promoting sort of things. We promote um, we've got public use of public transport, um, promote using electric vehicles um, and supporting the Enviro Schools program. And then we had three-year and ten-year actions. So under the three actions is to review the strategy, um, implement a low carbon events policy, update the fleet, do an energy audit, which we did, um, increase afforestation and restore wetlands um, for the community, running healthy homes, running renewable energy, um, and then under our ten-year actions transitioning the entire council fleet to electric vehicles and implementing solar technology, and then under the tenure action, supporting long-term bike hire and carpool car parking. I think that was in relation to the the train station. Uh, just out of curiosity, correct me if I'm wrong, but given that there are three-year and ten-year action plans, yes. how hmm, mindful are we of those actions when we do things like our annual plan and, and long-term plan? Because to be honest, I don't feel like we're very mindful of them at all. Um, and if you could just go back a screen. Um, yeah, I, I, I would, yes, no, yeah, yeah, I mean, I would wonder not, not feeding into the it's just, yeah it's just not feeding in I mean I know we've done things like update our fleet um rainwater collection is loosely in the district plan but I'd argue it's not because of this plan um yeah I wonder if some of the things that are happening are happening by chance or, or because of other things rather than actually actioning this action plan yeah I would agree with you mm -hmm. um yeah I think it's, and I think the tricky thing is where the sits, uh, I think we were talking about it before, um, you know, this would come into a lot of the infrastructure um, team development things or the operations, whereas sometimes I sit quite outside of all of that. So, yeah, how, and that's part of what I want to talk about in the review, like, yeah, how do we embed that so that, okay, and the paper comes to council and we're looking at um, building a new building for some new reason. It's like, okay, well, if we're going to do that, are we going to put rainwater collection into it? Are we going to um, put solar panels on? So, yeah, how do we make sure those actions are considered whenever we make relevance? And, and how are we measuring our success and what does success look like? And, and do the things on this list, um, are they priorities? Like, are we actually, yeah, prioritizing them and planning them into into our our daily 
and the Ten Commandments. Yeah, I think of too, like the reports that come to council and there's a the part where you have to say, you know, who, who does it affect, what does it affect, um, and climate change mark is on there and it very rarely is ticked. And I just feel like there's so few things you can do these days that doesn't affect climate change compared to how often it is ticked. So I feel like that little box needs to be extrapolated out and and more in the positive rather than in the mm. negative. So instead of having to pick it if you do, I feel like you have to, it should be that you have to explain how it doesn't impact climate change mm. or climate change. Mm. No, so yeah, absolutely. That's a good idea. Mm. Um, it's an underlying question that I've had in my mind for a long time. Um, about updating the fleet to EV and what do we do with the batteries when the batteries fail? Yeah. Mm. So mm. is moving to EV with lithium batteries actually worse for the climate than yeah. actually running the vehicles that we run? Um, I don't know where these are. I know that Tesla do power walls from their um, discarded car batteries for um, solar panels, for instance, but... Um, I don't know if that applies to everything else. And if we're going to move the fleet to total EV, what are we doing about that side of the EV equation? Yeah, I believe there's some very new sort of companies uh -huh. doing those sort of battery recycling things, but I don't think it's um, to the sort of large scale. It's I mean, if you look at where we are now with the generations of EVs that we've got compared to Gen 1 that were way back, you know, that did like four hours of driving and nothing else, <laughs> Um, they're obviously capable of big, much bigger range and those kind of yeah. things, but they're still made from lithium. That's right. But I think what we'd have to do a part of this, we'd have to look at the whole picture. And there is a lot of developments happening in the recycling, as you say. It depends on the brand. Yeah. So just, it would affect I guess the I just, purchase. Just yeah. kind of like the, it, it's not the be all and end all to, put to climate yeah. change because it has a consequence itself yeah, that yeah. we need yes. to figure well, out what um, that is. So, so allay, allay concerns about batteries. Um, so the big in a, the big battery group, the big industry group, the battery industry group. Sorry, it's been a long time since I've talked about them. Um, they are charged by the government um, with working out how to recycle batteries in New Zealand. Um, and there are there's certainly other, a company overseas who recycles. I think it's ninety eight percent of a lithium battery, including all of the um, composite components. That they recycle back to back to first grade, and then they can rebuild batteries out of them. Um, okay. Great opportunity for New Zealand to do that. Um, yeah. So that that is that work is underway. Um, uh, 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 so yeah, but people put them in in power as power walls as their house. So, mm -hmm. so the battery in my car will end up part of a house. Um, yeah. <laughs> and the difficult thing too is is trying to. Um, pick apart what's a climate change discussion and what's an environmental discussion because absolutely lithium mining is a big environmental issue and what we do with waste batteries, whether they can be reused or not yet, mm. is an issue, but that's not a climate change issue. Yeah. And so every litre of fossil fuel that we burn and we turn into a greenhouse gas, that's what we've got. I hear to you. Yeah. But 40 years ago, we didn't realise that putting things into landfill the way we were was going to create the, the greenhouse masses we've yes, got today. Right. So a consequence that we may think is okay today could actually increase the harm in the future. So it's just something that's been in my mind all the way yeah, through. Yeah, is that, yeah. you know, is lithium really the, the solution to this? And I know they're looking at hydrogen as, as another option and, and all of those kinds of things. That's a way, if it, lithium way down to me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We yeah. risk... Um, while we're waiting for perfection, uh, an action will ruin us. Yes. Doing nothing is worse. Doing nothing is worse than taking some risks. Mm -hmm. uh, and the industry certainly wants to recycle the lithium because it's so jolly expensive. So yeah. um, mm -hmm. We must have to be a real cash cow because um, the yeah. other thing is as well is that uh, normal cars and their batteries that they run on also have, you know, consequences too. So well, yeah. still, you, you know, there's still... Even though there's everything about, you know, because yep. there's more more being done with regards to lithium, it doesn't mean that the the current batteries are any, you know, that they're, they're actually yeah. the the way that we remove them, 
and um, get rid of them. It's, it's not necessarily but, always being done the right way either. I think look at from Australia yeah. is having um, responsible vehicle use. Mm. So it's not just about, well, do we buy mm. a fancy new battery car or not? Um, but it's how do we use the vehicles that we've got? And then what do we do with the vehicles when we are finished with them? Because the other thing that people like to do is go, well, I'm going to save the plan and buy a Tesla. Uh, and then I'm going to sell my fossil fuel burning car to another family that's going to continue using it to burn fossil fuel. So it's not just about saying, well, I've kept my nose clean and I've pushed the problem off to somebody else. So I think it's a broader thing about how we use vehicles, yeah. what we do with the vehicles over the, the lifespan of them. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, is there a way to, for us to reduce vehicle use? I, th I think that's the answer. The, the only real silver bullet is to reduce vehicle use because all the others, there's always going to be some trade off it's, and we have to look at every decision and weigh up all the bad points and the good points and do the best we can. It's, it's, there's no silver bullet that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just go with you every week, Kay, because you've got the battery and then um, that one I'm not using my car. <laughs> like the warm seat. Yeah, and, you know, I do like the warm seat as well. Yeah, and, like, I'm not huge on, I think, talking about the pool. Like, yeah, I agree, I agree with all those comments. I don't think EVs are the solution yeah. to our climate problems. So how do we make public transport more access accessible in our district? How do we cycle safely between... Greytown Cart or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, what are the other options that aren't necessarily the driving car in the first place? So you do it uh, in the highway. All right. Um, and so this is the kind of main thing that I wanted some feedback around. So since the strategy was adopted in early 2020, we have had coronavirus pandemic, um, large global inflation, international conflict, the extreme weather events over the last year, cost of living crisis, a change in government, and New Zealand now entering into a technical recession. So lots of, you know, fiscal constraints um, and climate change still playing out and creating bigger issues for especially our um, neighbours in the north. And so since, with all that in mind, what we're proposing to do over the next year or year and a next year um, is this in the strategy review. So reviewing on the set targets, are we happy with what's there currently? Do we want to, obviously it's just the same as what's in the climate change um, response act. Um, incorporating a strategic framework into the strategy. So um, like we were talking I can't remember who said it, sorry, but yeah, when you're writing, when people are writing council reports, is there a more clear framework people can move through? Be like, actually, not bad for climate change, or yes, this is a great, good thing. Um, as Melissa was saying, in the terms of the reporting cycles, how do we know that this is, act, you know, what is being actioned within the strategy more frequently? Um, a review of an amendment to the action plan, and in terms of the action plan, target engagement with Mana Whenua and Marae Partners, targeted engagement with other communities of place, identity and interest, and then as well as potentially a standard consultation with the community at large. So, um, yeah, I was mostly interested in what were your thoughts around these? Would you be happy going forward with that? Is there any things you find that are missing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so one of the things that I'd like to see for us as a council, so obviously we don't have super deep pockets, yeah. um, but what we can do is move more into the enabling space. Um, how do we enable other people within our community to take climate action? Mm. Uh, I really like the point about targeted engagement with mana whenua because that, to me, was a thing that's really missing from the original strategy um, and I think from a philosophical point of view there's not many people who have more of a vested interest in looking after the whenua than mana whenua uh, and I think that a lot of the stuff that we're putting into the strategy should be more of a co-design um, yeah co-design thing 
one of the things that I would really like to see us do, and I don't know if it's within the scope of the strategy or if it's something that we need to talk a bit more about council-wise, um, but I know when we have developers come to us and want to develop, we get a developer's contribution. In terms of being an enabler, is there a way to have a reduction or a category that you, if you meet a certain environmental standard of development, can you have a reduction in the developer's contribution? Contribution. So if somebody wanted to come and build an eco-village that totally recycled all of their rainwater and were off-grid power-wise, and you know, is there a way that if they met a certain Standard or category with that rebate or something. Yeah, yeah. not even so much a rebate, but just to get, the get the contributions in the first place because they would be mitigating their own impact on service. Is that not the case? How do you mean? Well, the whole purpose for the development contributions or financial contributions is to account for the impact on a wastewater treatment plant or water delivery or capacity. Mm -hmm. So if their rainwater harvesting and and within their own bubble and not impacting with those services, then they wouldn't get charged them in the first place. Well, that, that's so, the bonus, isn't it? That, is, they don't need to... Totally encourage that. Yeah, is that, like, well-known within the development space? Like, how we used to say None impact? of us knew. <laughs> it's, all, it's all predicated on growth and the growth impact on oh, well particular services. So if you're doing a development that's putting in septics and rainwater, there are no there are no impacts on your on your network. So so you're not having to pay for an in, an increase in that. Uh, I, get, I, I get that, but I mean, but how do we how do we encourage that? There is this uh, green standard for building, right? So if you if you go for the full green standard of building, you are recycling grey water, you're using solar, um, all of those kind of things within that bubble anyway. Yeah, but then if you are if you have got a septic tank and you're where the line of sewage goes, you still pay because you could be connected. Technically, for rates. Yes, yes that's right. We're not right. talking about rates, no, we're talking no, about development. No, that's right. That would make, that's have to be looked at. If we're yeah. And that is something that you could look at. You yes. can decrease that or remove it, but if you yes. remove that, everyone else's rates go up. Uh -uh. Well, that's right, but if they're not using it's it. It's a perverse relationship in that space. Why yes. you start looking at those things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, no, for example, in Greytown, where they have the Greytown orchards, they have... So, no connection for stormwater. They manage all of their stormwater on site. Is that right? Great. Yeah. So that would be an example where they haven't had to have as much development developer contribution because of that. Our nursery is the same. Is that the time? Do rainwater. Yeah. 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 We're not talking about JS. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, because um, just following on from what you put up, I I think uh, as well. Like, what can we do as a council? Um, and with the enabling. So it's things as well, like, so when Five Rivers was going in, did we talk to them about how many EV points, like, you know, that they might be able to put in their, in their parking spaces? Um, same with the retirement village, how many EV, you know, might have, might have been able to go in there. Every time that we're looking at things and being able to actually make it so people will, will think Think green, you know, when, when they're doing it. But but as far as infrastructure, you know, we can actually help really guide that because at the moment we've got one mm. in the whole south, you know, like it's a it's very it's not. I talked to Stefan about engineering standards because we don't currently have any SWDC specific engineering standards, and that could be part of that process. Yeah. That so yeah, you know, these are the engineering standards, but an green alternative would be something else. Yeah, I think it would be really cool. I mean, even if we could talk, I don't know. I don't it's know if we've missed the see policy. I've not seen your financial. Yeah, policy. I'm saying so it may be lacking words that encourage that in the policy or don't make it. Yeah, I know that. I know they had something like that down in Marlborough because that's why when um, I can't think of the, what the vineyard is but when they when they redid all of these cellar doors, they they put in three. EV points Just as a, for people to be able to do that yeah. because that was one one of the things that was requested yeah, from the yes, you know, we, you know, to, to be able to do that to help them. Just on that though, the uh, the working men's co looking at putting four spaces and they've got a deal going probably with BP at the moment. Who's that? The working men's club in Greytown. Oh yeah, great. So there might be four spaces going in there with a deal they've done with. I think it's BP or Z, yeah. one of those two. BP. I think it's BP. Yeah. And um, Genesis Power do it as well. Yeah. Uh, but it's a great, but I, I, I get your point. It's a great, you know, it should be encouraged, right? Yeah, yeah. I just, I just think, you know, it's, it's those, it's those smaller things. And I mean, I, I don't believe that 
I've never thought about what you were saying and the fact that that would actually, you know, what people pay as their contribution, how much of an impact that would actually like have to, you know, for mitigation, but for us as well as a council as well. And and so, I mean, that's that's never even been on my radar, guys. Like you've opened my eyes big time yeah. to that. And, yeah. uh, you know, that yeah. would that could actually be quite massive. Well, yeah. As you said, yeah. I think we sort of always look for carrot stick. Well, we think, we, we think we, and we have to be the one pushing and, yeah. and doing it. Yeah, because like, there's some, some happening. Because I went to the Sim Simplicity Housing um, presentation yesterday, and they're building these cheap to rent houses for low paid workers, not rent houses. But they're putting, it's only partial, but they're putting big water tanks and, and solar stuff. That? Uh, that should be. Yeah. Where's that zone? They're, well, they're doing that. They come to the, now the wire wrapper in Wellington, looking here. But they've got, I think, six hundred houses on the books now. Apartments around them to build, isn't it? Is that what no, it's no, it's not actually. Sam, what, Sam, 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's to just to rent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's you, 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 rent to buy. It's rent to buy. It's no, it's not rent to buy. No, it's it not. is. No, no, it's not. I went to presentations there, and I had a meeting with them. But you can have a, a ten-year. Lease or commitment to it, but um, at the moment you can't buy them because well, they didn't want that to happen because then people um, sell them and get the high price for them and it oh, sets it up. Yeah, but um, but they have big gardens and do the whole green thing with trees and stuff. Um, so they get the tanks for all their water and stuff like that. They don't do sewage and they've got solar panels, but not enough only for the shared services, but but it's starting to happen and that's part of the resource. Mm. Most impressive presentation actually. Yeah. Yeah. So that's great. So it's been thought about and then yeah that helps with the contribution. I yes. guess, yeah. Know. So I think I think for us as, as a council, it's about not just looking at what other companies or organizations do, but it's about what is our business as usual mm. and how can that be adjusted or expanded to yeah to enable so it's not it's not just about saying oh well we're going to give you money back if you do this we're going to charge you fines if you do that and we you know it's a good thing. yeah yeah so one of the things is maybe looking at like consents for new bills like what are the standards that we have for that i don't know how tied up that is with the building act or um i think local authorities can can set different standards for new things. Well, it's got to be tied up with the Building Act. Yeah. Um, it can meet the Building Act, but then I think you can have... I don't know that you can, to be honest. I think you're governed by the regulations mm. that sit behind the Act. Yeah, I think it's just the... Um, I think you can have conversations with mm. developers about going beyond those regulations, but I don't think we can specify regulations of our own. So... That their, their preferred solution or their alternate solution has to, at the very limit, basic level, meet the conditions of the regulations in the Building Act and the Code. Mm. Yes. Um, if they want to go higher than that, you know, if they want to do a higher level of insulation or all of those kind of things, then that's that's extra. But I don't think we could put it in as part of our consenting mm. process. Mm. So even if you had something like, you know, amount of hard stand to green area. That's your resource consent. Your permeable surface comes under your resource consent, not under your building consent, which is not council. Resource consent is given. Oh, amazing. So is it, is the, yeah. But again, you, you, you're dealing with RMA rules right. at that point. And we can't set our own I don't think so. No, I think it's, it's governed by the RMA. Because I feel like those are the spaces that we could push into to look at is there yeah, ways to enable better decision-making well, I think it's like at the moment there's no I think there's no things, they can, really. you know things like have you considered recycling grey water for use in bathrooms those kind of things there's things you can put in there as like public service messaging but I don't think we can enforce them as nobody's going to rules that we apply but you know we can definitely look into it mm. and the uh, on the idea of actually like taking council decision making though if there's perhaps that space kind of governed by regulation outside of our control. Is there a space, though, for kind of going back to what you were saying before about the consideration given to um, climate change in our papers mm. and actually have, have a council policy that uh, directs officers for ourselves to actually just 
take a far greater uh, climate change strategy lens to things. So like this morning when we were talking about the flooding in Brandon and Hart Street, like there are some things that could be done that would, yes, improve the drainage situation there and the flooding, but actually by doing a whole lot of planting um, would kind of have a double effect, which would fix the help with the flooding, but also have sort of a, a climate and environmental benefit as well. So rather than just going, oh, it's drainage, we'll just put in a pipe. A bigger pipe. Yeah. Bigger pipe, actually. Sponge so it's bigger than X. Yeah. So that comes, planting and that, Yeah, and that, that comes back to that, that, comes back to that green and the grey hmm. idea, right, that we talked hmm. about last year, of like, you know, like what can we do? And those, rather than just putting in a concrete chicane around a, a traffic island with gravel in the centre of it, which then just spills water everywhere, how can we... Do something that actually helps with the and, helps with the problem that we just created, and probably is less expensive or equally totally. less expensive as the traditional yeah. grey mm. uh, yeah. option, mm. um, but actually ticks a whole lot of boxes for what we as a council yeah. seem to be important. Yeah, yeah, it would be good to have a clause at the end of um, you know any of these proposals where it's, it's put you know this, this is mm. the. the the green the benefits to the green strategy or something. I think that'd be really good as you know, compulsory fill in. So I think sometimes when I think oh, some of the kind of negative reaction to some of the stuff that we see around this table and in the community is because some of the concepts feel so big. So we get this whole, ah, oh, what is that council possibly a waste yeah. of time. Whereas if you could actually see benefit and quite immediate benefit within your local town or district, um, it might feel a bit more achievable or approachable for community as well. Yeah. And some people are always in a bunch. I did actually ask what they were doing at the college gym. Oh, great. Right. Um, where they cycling grey water and using solar panels, and I was told about this within the specifications. Oh, I did channel you and you. go down that avenue to say, what are we doing? You know, what well, actually, we doing? yeah, yeah, we should be. I mean, that, was, that, that was my question. That was my question with the Waihinga Centre mm -hmm. when it went up, was why it didn't have solar panels and it didn't have any kind of water catchment on it because... You know, that, that grey water could have been used for the twenty four park, um, just, just to be able to water the trees and things in the park. And then, um, you know, the solar would have actually helped to, to run the whole building, of course, so yeah. for much cheaper. So so thinking thinking that way all the time. And, um, yeah, the the, yeah, thinking was a little bit different when I first Has the water tank gone on to Greytown yet? No, you maybe just think of it, actually. Just, yeah, when you, when, yeah, I'll fill that up. It was always later on. Mm. Um. Yeah, and I think the, the other thing that we need to drill down on with the strategy, I don't know if it's just under this umbrella, but the two parts of the stuff that we need to be looking at with climate change is mitigation and adaptation. Um, and so, yeah, I guess just to kind of break that down, mitigation is reducing our impacts on climate change. Adaptation is how do we get ready for the effects of climate change. Um, and I think it's one thing that we need to be super aware of from a council perspective, having seen what happened to a lot of farmers in Australia when they hit really big droughts, to have daily on the news about suicides, about people walking off their land, about yeah. animal welfare tanking, yeah. like, it's pretty serious stuff. Yeah. And I know we are in an environment where often... The discussions about climate change, the biggest pushback comes from the agricultural center, sector because recently they've been the ones that have been hit with the stick and has worked too much. Um, but from a, a purely mercenary point of view, a huge amount of our income on council comes from rates from farmers. And if they're not able to pay their bills because they're not able to farm the animals that they need to farm because they're so affected by drought, this is all the stuff that we need to, I don't know how you wedge that into, into a strategy. It's a bit of a downer, but it is something that we need to keep our eyes on. Um, yeah. And and 
So just just so you know, council was aware. Uh, so so not just council, but rural community within the South Wairarapa were well aware of that because they had tried to set up a uh, not not a buddy system, but that 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 literally where where the farmers uh, over and and oh, was it New South Wales? No, yeah, where, where was it? That where the where the droughts were happening. Um, uh, and and Jeffy had actually like had been one of the leaders on it with council, um, a, a partnering where where the family could just come here for just 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 to, to get away as a respite, and and mm -hmm. and and they would be looked after, have their own accommodation and things, um, out on one of the farms over here, and 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 that was something that they were doing within the the area, so. You could almost put some kind of wording around that because it's not like the farming community here, you know, wasn't fully no. all over that as as a, as a farming community. Or, Do we think that is it worthwhile just recognizing the fact that for a whole raft of reasons, um, in part due to the fact that farmers over the last few years sort of have taken a a real hammering in, in the climate change oh, yeah. Is it worth recognising that and actually going, what? how can we talk about all of these concepts without actually using the C word, climate change? Um, because actually, as you've said, our farmers know. They're, they're aware of what the it's an amazing network. climate it is an amazing. Has, yeah. has an effect on their business. They, they they know that better than anyone. But actually, when we use the term climate change, people go, ugh, or ugh. Yep. Whereas maybe if we just talked about the effects of drought or the effects of yeah. flooding or extreme weather or yeah. whatever it was, we might get a better engagement with the same outcome and purpose. Like yeah. Internally, we know we're addressing climate change, but... But actually, we're making it easy. Look at a well-being check. Hmm. What was very sad though was mm -hmm. that there was practically no pickup mm -hmm. from the Australian counterparts, and that that was because they actually couldn't want to come and see what farm the farms were looking like over no, here. No, come and see a lush so farm mm -hmm. at themselves. So, mm -hmm. so completely understandable. Like, like in that respect, completely understandable. But what? I, uh, but so, so that was really sad. But it just there was a connect connection already there that I don't know if um, if GP had been involved with one of the councils over there but it may be good to have like possibly we could even get someone to zoom in I, I don't know like like to actually have a talk about what they saw from the effects of it from the drought and knowing that this area is just very susceptible to drought anyway yeah well, I guess it have that conversation maybe dipping our toes a little bit into an area that is not really for us. Mm -hmm. But federated farmers were very good at, at, you know, they do link those communities yeah. together. And I think there was somebody in that role during the during COVID that was that sort of yeah. um, liaison, like rural community yeah. liaison who was travelling around and making sure yeah. that was doing that. So yeah, it's some rural, it's some rural support did a lot of that yeah. around here. Yeah. So for us, it's yeah. supportive of that mahi, but not yeah. doing any of that. I guess. But I think, yeah, if we're looking at, I guess, rebranding it, making sure that we're talking about, like, sustainability of the agricultural industry, not just, like, sustainability from that. You recycle. Yeah, but actually, <laughs> so, how do you retain you your industry? Yes. Yeah. 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 Which just makes it sound like, actually, we are trying to have a conversation with you that mm -hmm. is supportive rather than one where we're we want to tell you that yeah, this is on a name. The reason of, of you know of all of our yeah. problems. Yeah. Do have in our emissions like the stuff that you were the bar graphs that you were showing and, and that you know a huge amount of the emissions from our region are agriculture. Mm -hmm. I would say that there's opportunity in there in terms of supporting and enabling business developments um in terms of research for uh, different agricultural techniques. Um, I know that certainly uh, places like Lincoln University that, that 
that took, they're the ones that are doing like the vaccine for cows and then there's stuff around like seaweed feeding and, and various bits and pieces. Um, and I know we support our tourism industry. Do we also support our agricultural industry mm. in terms of that space? Um, so WED has some funding to do some, uh, some research and work in the ag space around um, like future proofing, like are we doing the right kind of farming? Mm -hmm. um, should we be growing oats in this mm -hmm. area rather than farming cows? Like, so they're doing some some research in that space. Um, but I, as far as I'm aware, that, that's the only kind of ag mm -hmm. work that I'm aware of the council having any input into. It might be yeah. a bit late yeah. stage now. They drain the lake out to keep those cows, so they can be yeah. doing them. Okay. <laughs> yeah, they so. took all our land to have those cows. So, because the only thing is that you know, using the, the um, that type mm -hmm. of seaweed as well, they're going to need to probably do a few tests because it, it it can cause within humans, which means that it could probably possibly cause it with cows as well, like um, liver failure and things like that. So, or oh, you know, yeah. like different functions. So that they, they, they need to make sure because even though it can cut. But maybe that's how it cuts the emissions by 90%. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the cow. Part of the fittest. Part of the fittest. Only 10% uh, mm -hmm. left. Um, leave the meat to the land. Um, to go back to the report thing, um, I know one of the things that we do is have KPIs in our uh, annual reports for council, certainly for council staff. Do we have any climate change specific KPIs? Mm -hmm. um, at the moment, the enhanced annual plan will con continue to run on the LTP ones that we've got. And then so we, we, when we do the LTP for June 2025, um, that's when we get to refresh them. So if we were to put that into our strategy, our climate change strategy now, that future LTPs will... Whatever you do, they have to be achievable and measurable targets. They can't just be statements. So... Mm -hmm. We've got time to work that out. And um, one of the things that I have said, and I think Nikki will pick up, is to make sure that Sky is involved before we get too far into the numbers to make sure that these things are getting picked up appropriately so that we can actually respond. Yeah, yep. Climate change is actually an entire section in the self-assessment from the audit with the full council, which includes KPIs, uh, which is separate to the KPIs as well. So that's part of the overall assessment. Going, and the strategy must be included in the long-term plan as a supporting document. So there is quite a nice connection there with LTP as well. But is it that the strategy is kind of bolted onto the LTP? Like, is there a way that we can have the strategy a bit more? Yeah, yeah so I think one is basically things have been in the past and the other is we're going to do it. Yes. I, I would, that would Absolutely. I mean, that's what I want to see happen because I don't want this... Um, all the you know the waste minimization plans, all those things that we've got that we're committing to should be woven through what we do, not sit to the side mm -hmm. and, and we get to celebrations going, oh, what did we do with that? We haven't put that in yet. Yeah. So we they, they all need to be considered as part of the um, environmental scan before we kick off. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I suppose the only other maybe what and it sounds based on your feedback just then, is around where do you see the scope of the strategy? Do you see it as a purely council internal document or is it we want to be going wider into our agricultural communities, our towns, you know, maybe slightly beyond what council's remit is in terms of like do we want to be, you know, working with our communities and what they can do, even if it's maybe not work that's directly related with what council does. I, mean, I think that we're an enabler, so it's up to us to educate and provide those things on our websites and on our communications. Um, but we also have to walk the talk, right? So we, we're going to have to change our own dials to make sure that we meet our own obligations. We're going to have to report on these at some point soon because it's becoming a, a, a requirement for us to report on our carbon. I'm sure the starting point is within the council to begin with, and then it gets pulled out. As you say, we've got to walk the walk first, right? We're doing. 
It's a bit like the water leak scenario, right? If you if you go try and um, preach to the community about what they should be doing for dealing with severe weather events or drought, they're going to look to us first and say, well, what are you doing? You know, you're still doing this and that and the other. So, um, yes, that's for sure. I would like to see us become digital friends. And, you know, the meetings that we have over the hill in, in Lower Hutt is great for the Lower Huttians, but it's two and a half, three hours of driving for us to get there. So the more we can dial into those and then attend in person, the better, I think. Are you not able to then? We can, but there are. You feel as if that you're you're letting the side down by not being present in the room. So I don't go to the mall. I suppose <laughs> here maybe every one in three I'll go over the hill. What do you think the new um, appetite would be for developing? Uh, I don't even know if this actually exists. It might well exist, but a wider up a public transport plan. Because there's no point in us just getting a nice little cute fleet of electric buses that go between Featherston and Greytown and Martinborough, even though that would be lovely. But a lot of people commute up to Masterton and back every day, and there's not much in the way of buses. And the buses that we do have are all diesel, I think. It's a Greater Wellington conversation. Yeah. Transport requirements sit with Greater Wellington, not with us. What advocacy have we got with Greater Wellington from the council? So, space? Um, transport gets discussed at the Regional Transport Committee, uh, gets discussed at the Wadarapa Committee, both of which GW sit at, would get discussed in the, at the Wellington Region, Regional Leadership Committee. Um, and I can tell you from Monday's Wadarapa Committee that um, bus capacity is back to pre-COVID. It was one of the snip, snippets of information. We've finally and reached the in the use. Yeah, so the bus service usage is back to pre-COVID levels. Um, train use is down, but that's more to do with the delay. That's more to do with the fact that you can't rely on the train. Mm -hmm. um, no, I missed his train this morning because rather than it's 15 minutes, lateness it was three minutes late um and and the second third train which is always at least 15 minutes late was six minutes late so we very nearly missed that as well so despite the fact that g-dub and kiwi rail are now saying you can rely on the fact that your train will be 15 minutes late you, can, you cannot even rely on that no. um so train usage is down bus use is up um the g-dub and kiwi rail painfully aware of their shortcomings in the train mm. space um, and they seem to just be very much focused on getting to 2029 or whatever the date is for their new fleet of trains and the miracle that will occur at that time in terms of service and uptake. But yeah. so I don't know that there's a lot of people who use the trains to commute around the wider up, though. Like it all seems to be either going over the hill or further up the line. That was a bus. Yeah. 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 But is that something that we could... Ex explore a little bit. Yeah. Well, it doesn't work very well from here because you have to catch the bus to get this done. Yeah, and train to Masterton. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. There's a space, um, definitely for advocacy of mm -hmm. of the bus network. Um, potentially a good piece for the combined council. Yeah. Um, in the just as an FYI, the direction that the mayors and deputy mayors want to take with the uh, combined council meetings is much more at a regional uh, what are we doing across the region how can we make things work better rather than kind of and developing more of a not decision making because obviously that can't be done in that forum but kind of much more direction setting um, so that those meetings become more meaningful as well. So something like looking at regional transport would be a great thing to discuss there with decision-making at individual council tables for collective advocacy mm -hmm. up the chain, um, so making use of those pathways as well. I don't want to tell they've got their, like, met, like on demand sort of signals. Mm -hmm. It's like it's essentially like a taxi but not because yeah, there's, like, previous... You know, decided places we can get picked up from, but there's no necessary timetable. Yeah. Is that something that could be an option? 
Yeah, or even if Greater Wellington is supplying the buses and, and doing what they're doing, is there a way for us to subsidise for some people? Like under 18s, with services cards, and I know they get mm. up to now it's been for free, but I think they're in the process at the moment. But if that's something that we could have in the in the climate change strategy, that we look for opportunities for advocacy for um yeah regional collaboration. Mm. Sure. Cool. All right. Thank you, everyone. I just had um so I took this as a paper to policy and projects at Carpenter this morning. Um and so the only real uh, obviously a different sort of forum, not a workshop. So. Uh, the only points they also had were around the name of the strategy, around the being the Rumahanga strategy, getting a little confused with being the Rumahanga roads as well. Um, so maybe differentiating it a bit more. So it's obvious that we talk about climate change uh, or environmental change. Um, and then, yeah, same with the targets. Are we for council only or are we for the wider district? It sounds like we're for that enabling sort of space. Yeah, that's all from me. Well, nice to know we're not a million yeah. miles away from CDC this week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who did more engagement? Yeah. We started talking about environmental change rather than climate change. I'm a big fan of uh, climate change by stealth. So, cool, it would have is yeah. climate change. Well, from it, because it's like if you decide to bike to work every day instead of drive, that's a health benefit for you. Or if you decide to plant up this area for your Tiny forest. Yeah, it's a it's a um, tiny forest. It's a climate thing. Yeah, it's an, it's an environmental thing. Too. It's also yeah. a purifying thing. So I am like you say, like because some people get really <laughs> about the word climate change. I like to think that something else. Where I can, when you're talking about reducing emissions, you can't even really call it that. But really, like where they took it in, like you said, they have a. Um, I think it's a minister for uh, generations. future generations. So everything's run through that lens as to what impact is this going to have mm. in the future. So that's like they took their transport strategy and ran it through that and went, oh, actually, all these things that we've pretty much are ready to break around on are not going to benefit future generations at all and, in fact, will cause some harm. So let's stop it from being a transport strategy and... Future generations. Is it a health and well-being strategy, and how do we enable health and well-being? And yeah, yeah it just it, I think just a different way of yeah. Or it's matter, right? Yeah, rather than planting trees and sequencing power. carbon, is it you're building shelter belts to improve soil on farm and riparian areas to stop contaminants? Is is that a is that a direction for the CDC are asking for more clarity for the name of the strategy? And we are talking about uh, creating terms that are more user friendly. Then, as some sort of future generations strategy, mm -hmm. actually the direction that we want potentially to go in. Ministry for the future. Oh, we have to. We have to think about the generations. If you've read that book, I sure have. Yeah, I'll be thinking about it. Down the line. It's great though. I know. Hard read though. <laughs> Not hard to read. Hard content. <laughs> for my grandchildren. Start what I care about now. Willing to do angel. Oh, all right. Um, if everyone's got all that they needed out, um, thank you so much. That's really That's helpful works, for guy. me to yeah, kind of start turning out some actual work now. <laughs> Can I make a get on test? I know you're doing uh, lots of very good work. Um, super, super stoked to be having conversations like this. But with this presentation, would you be able to take it to the Māori Standing Committee as well, just to make sure that we've got... Did I Did I bring the presentation? You did. I did, yes. Did? Oh, yes. She has been through Māori Standing Committee. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, so Maybe to... they want, might want to see your new one. Oh, yes. That's the same. Yeah. 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 Oh, although we've seen it. We have seen it. No, 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 but we've actually we seen that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Māori Standing Committee, sorry. Yeah. I... I it wouldn't hurt just to maybe send it out beforehand, just to ask, the, like, like with the questions. Yeah, the ready. Ready. Those are, so that way, ready. rather than having to run through the whole thing, yeah. you, you'll be able to just say, you know, these are the Remember questions. this. Now and to... 
no yeah, thinking yeah. that, that way. But then what you see is so many like strategies and plans. It's like 0. 0.45 or something. Yeah, it's a bit that blurry that after a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah it was Iwi and Mana Fenua. And then it's like, what? Yeah. You're just like, I get stuck at saying Iwi and Mana Fenua. They just like, like off Iwi and leave Mana Fenua. Yeah, because they're not Mana Fenua. <laughs> <laughs> they don't own it. Yeah. They do. <laughs> Yeah, that was very right. <laughs> very good. That was very inspiring. Any clothes or things? Well, I like it. I think, yeah. All right, what today? I have to put this to Karapu. Uh, yeah, you know who will be. Oh, who will be. Yeah, we'll come back and I'll be like, you can have the seat, but I'm taking the game. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank